5 of Galatians, I would summarize it as the Ruach versus the flesh. Rabbi Paul, all the way through, has been uh, giving us a revelation of Messiah Yeshua and arguing to his context is specifically to non-Jews, convincing them about the necessity of continuing faith in Yeshua and continuing to be empowered by the Ruach and not to drift into thinking that keeping the Torah somehow could replace Yeshua or the Ruach. That's really his, his argument all the way through, and I left my scriptures on my seat, so I'm going to grab my sword, and we'll read through together. So I won't read all the verses of chapter 5 because it's, uh, it's a long section, but we'll take parts of it. And uh, before we read in chapter 5, I want to give some um, <clears throat> context from where we were in chapter 4 and just a little review. You remember chapter 4 it was Paul's midrash on Abraham's two sons, and, uh, and by implication, Abraham's uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Hagar and Sarah, his really wives, one was a concubine, but through that act was like an act of marriage. So Hagar, and it's referring back to Isaiah 54, that's where Paul's making his uh, midrash from, uh, and so we read all that last time. Uh, from Isaiah, but if we were to summarize, what is he saying here? He is saying that uh, Hagar is referred to as the married one and, uh, and represents Israel in exile because of disobedience to the covenant, and Sarah, the barren one, is Israel restored in new covenant. So it's not Old Testament versus New Testament as one canceling the other. It has more to do with disobedience to the covenant versus walking in freedom in the covenant. Not a, not a getting rid of one or the other. It has to be with how we're relating to it. Israel, in their own strength, didn't do very well with the covenant. We agreed upon that. We still agree upon that. Israel overall, if you go to Israel, even looking at the population, the modern state of Israel, seculars are still the majority. So Israel's still not doing a great job walking in covenant. Nor have they historically been. And that's not a diminish to the Jewish people. It's just a reality. It's uh, difficult to walk in covenant. That's why we need the Ruach. And that's the message of the Brit Hadashah. So the next conclusion from last week would be the new covenant empowers Jewish people and non-Jewish people to walk in freedom from slavery of sin by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. That's, if you're going to really summarize uh, the book of Galatians, it's the message that you need the Ruach. Keep your focus where it needs to be. We talked about being in a Torah-observant congregation versus the Messiah-centered, and I would even say a Ruach-centered congregation. Amen. Without it, uh, Israel didn't do very well. Still not doing very well. Done amazing things, without a doubt. The Jewish people have had more influence on society and culture than any other people group. But as far as keeping the Torah, not so much. I mean, I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's, uh, the Jewish people have maintained the scriptures for us, have maintained the covenants, have, but it's been a minority. It's always been a remnant. It's not the, the mass population. Even before the Shoah, there was basically diminished Torah observance. It, it wasn't a great religious community. In fact, it was an assimilated community in Eastern in Europe. <clears throat> so Paul's arguing Jewish people need the Ruach, non-Jewish people need the Ruach. I think I could have maybe summarized this for him Paul, just can, we can do this in like a paragraph or two, but he had, he had some reason to uh, go the whole book, so we'll, we'll follow along with his teaching. So let's move into chapter 5, and uh, we'll start reading. <clears throat> Paul says, listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. Again, I tell you, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he's obligated to keep the whole of the Torah. You who are trying to be justified by Torah, you've been cut off from the Messiah. You've fallen away from grace. Remember we started out with the grace message? I used to be against hyper-grace teachers. I still uh, don't like hyper-grace because I think there's a context to grace, but I'm becoming a grace preacher. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Grace is not a license to sin. That's why I have a problem with some of the grace preachers because they, they you know, whoo-hoo, anything goes. If anything, grace should make us that much more thankful for our salvation and teach us to walk in righteousness. Amen. Not a license to sin, it's a license to obey. Amen. That's right. We should be very grateful. 
We've been delivered out of sin. Hallelujah. Let's live to the one that redeemed us. Amen. Glory to God. We're grateful what he's done. It's like someone paying for your meal and you say, ah, you know, eh, forget it. You know, no, no thanks necessary. And that's just a meal. But imagine if you got delivered out of s slavery. You got bought. Someone paid your way. How much more grateful you'd be. That's the way we should all be. We've been set free from sin. We've been delivered out of bondage. We've, we've left spiritual Egypt. We've been delivered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It should be all of our testimony. Hallelujah. Amen. So the first verse, remember I told you really chapter 5 verse 1 should probably go with the last chapter. Whoever made the section markers doesn't, it's all right. They weren't anointed, but uh, it really seems like it fits chapter 4 better or so. Chapter 5, verse 1 said, If for freedom, Messiah set us free, so stand firm and don't be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. So he's saying, you know, don't use your freedom. Don't use this grace as a license to sin. Don't get stuck in slavery again. You've been set free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. A good preacher once made that quote. We're <laughs> coming up on the anniversary or the uh, Black History Month, and I think it's time to reclaim that history for the black preachers that really laid the foundation for the community here in America and celebrate. MLK was quite a preacher. Read some of his sermons sometimes. Boy, he had it right. I don't know about everything, but his sermons, pretty good. I don't know enough about him to, have to actually know anything he did wrong, but uh, there's all of us have something we might not have got right, but uh, he had some great contributions to our society. Um. So what's going on here? Remember I said the whole context of the book is about Gentiles uh, and their relationship to the Torah, their relationship to uh, Yeshua, their relationship to the Ruach. We know that some, we remember we taught in the early chapters, some people came down from some Jewish observant Jews, Orthodox Jews came down from, this is before Orthodox existed, but some zealous uh, Pharisaic Jews came down from Judea and uh, uh, start teaching people that unless you become circumcised, you can't be saved. So literally, unless you become Jewish, you can't be saved. And uh, Peter even got swept up in it and stopped eating with the non-Jews, as did Barnabas. Sweet Barnabas abandoned the Jews. Uh, sorry, abandoned the Gentiles and started separating. So that we got this strange separation where there's this kind of this... Uh, uh, they had this fellowship, but then you know they got this idea that uh, these non-Jews really weren't kosher, and we should separate from them. And uh, I understand it. Uh, you know that Israel is called to be a set-apart nation, so it's this tension that the Jewish people have that to be a set-apart nation, but yet to be a light to the nations. How does that work? We're supposed to be set apart, but we're supposed to be a light. You know, on one hand we're pulling, the other hand we're pushing. It's this it's this uh, difficult relationship that the Jewish people have. The whole context then, non-Jews felt like, you know, these Jewish people are saying, you need to be circumcised. You need to become Jewish in order to be saved. That's the context of this. And Paul tells them, if you get circumcised, literally you convert and become Jewish, then Messiah will be no benefit of all to you. Again, I testify every man who lets himself to be circumcised, he's obligated to keep the whole of the Torah. You who are trying to be justified by the Torah have been cut off from Messiah. You've fallen away from grace. So what's the issue here? This idea of salvation through Torah, or salvation by becoming Jewish, or salvation of works salvation. He said, if you're trying to be justified by the Torah, you've missed the mark, because it's a free gift through Messiah Yeshua. So if you can earn it, you've nullified Yeshua's work. His work is complete. You can't add to his work. Uh, you could take away from it by trying to do your own works, but his work is complete, and you don't add to his work. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a gift. It's grace. By grace have you been saved. Uh, and you've fallen away from grace if you're trying to merit it on your own. So what is Paul saying here? I would say, to summarize Paul, Paul teaches that Gentiles who are trying to be justified by keeping the Torah have been cut off from Messiah and have fallen from grace. If you're, if you're trying to earn it on your own through keeping Torah, you've missed the mark. Because Messiah is the one that brings, makes you righteous before Adonai. Amen? Now, there's fruits of that. I get that. We'll get there. But if you're trying to work it out somehow and think that you're in better standing with God because you're keeping the Torah, your standing before God comes from Messiah Yeshua. Amen? His righteousness became your righteousness. All right. So moving along then, uh, 
I would again bring up the scripture that is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift from God. As much as it is a gift from the children of Israel getting delivered out of Egypt, so is your salvation a gift from Messiah Yeshua. Be thankful for your gift. Amen? Yeah. It's a gift. Don't return it to the sender. Enjoy it. Embrace it. Yeah. And out of that certainly comes a heart attitude of gratefulness. I think grace looks a lot like Torah observance, but it's a byproduct, not a prime product. Do you get it? It's a thankfulness out of what you've been given, that you walk in obedience. But you're not adding to Yeshua's atonement. You're merely walking in the blessing of it. Amen? So to summarize, I would say Paul teaches that, ooh, I'm ahead of myself. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah, why not? I'll come back to it. On the flip side, he says if you get circumcised, you're obligated to keep the whole of the Torah. So if you become Jewish... You're not obligated to keep the whole of the Torah. Paul teaches that Jewish people are required to keep the whole Torah, but I'd say it's as part of their covenantal call as a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Do you get it? It's not salvation. It's calling. Because you can actually, according to Scripture, be cut off from Israel. That doesn't really happen much anymore. But according to the Bible, you could be cut off by not keeping covenant, by not keeping the Mosaic Covenant. You would lose your status. According to scripture, you'd be cut off from the community. We can get into the theology of how that all works, but that's not my goal right now. God clearly can bring branches that were broken off back in. Uh, but it has to do with calling, not salvation. Do you see how that works? The Torah is not about salvation. Torah is about calling. The Jewish people's calling. So therefore, if a Jewish person isn't keeping Torah, they're not doing a great job at keeping their calling. Remember the call of according to Isaiah 49 is to be a light to the nations. Part of being a light to the nations is walking in covenant with Hashem, living out the principles of his words so that the whole world might see that this is what it looks like to walk after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When the Jewish people don't do their part, it loses that light to the nations. Do you see how that works? That's what Paul's talking about. So he says, if you become Jewish, you've got to keep the whole deal. So be careful, those of you with your genealogy saying, hey, I'm 9%. What does that mean? 9% of you has to keep the Torah? Maybe that's about the percentage you're keeping. Just saying. It's fine, dude, ancestry, DNA, I get it. Actually, that stuff's very unreliable, you know that? Extremely unreliable. You know where DNA works very good? In determining whether my wife and I are actually related. It's extremely good at that because you can compare my DNA to her DNA. And you can say, ah, no, no relatives here. Yay, we can marry. You know where it's not very good? Generations and generations and generations ago. It's not admissible in Israel. The only way it's admissible in Israel is if you already made Aliyah and you proved you were Jewish and you still have somebody living back in Ukraine who says, well, I'm, I'm his son. I should be able to make Aliyah too. And then we could do a paternity test and say, yep, that's my son. And he can make Aliyah. But you can't go and take your 9% and say, I'm Jewish. Welcome me to the Jewish state. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. Jewish agency might laugh you out the door. It makes good business, it's, uh, but it's not a reliable way of saying, because what does it mean, 9%? What, what, what does that mean? I mean, what is 9%? It's very hard to determine. What, what does 9% mean? And generally, it means that you match someone of Eastern European descent who also had similar DNA that self-identified as Jewish, so you have 9% of common DNA with that person. It's fine. Do your DNA test, because I know you will anyways. Spend your money and be confused at the results. But just say, Rabbi, told you so. It's all right. I've got plenty of people that did, and it's all right. I love you all. I haven't done it. Baruch Hashem. I haven't wasted my money. But um, it's not reliable. It's, uh, there's, it's, uh, unless, unless you're really trying to determine direct kinship 
or if you're at the site of a murder or a crime scene, we can tell you definitely that's your blood. Your DNA matches that. That we can tell with 100% certainty. 1,500 years ago, mm, not so much. We could see some similarities. I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but uh, God bless you if it, uh, if it ministers. But be careful wanting to be Jewish. That's where I was going with all that, wanting to be Jewish. Maybe we need your 20% to be a little more allegiant to Torah. For all my Jewish friends in the congregation, be the light you're called to be. For all my non-Jewish people, we get to join along the call. We, we come alongside. But be careful what you wish for. It's better to get to versus got to. There's a lot of liberty in get to. Got to? Now I have to do it. Got to is kind of nice. If I didn't quite make it right on Shabbat, I got to. I'm trying to. I'm getting closer. But when I got to, now the bars. Do you see how that works? So he says, if you become circumcised, now you're required to keep the whole thing. You become Jewish, you're required to keep the whole thing. So to my online audience, if you're a Jewish person and you're in the church, you've got to grapple with this. It's an eternal call. The gifts and call of God are irrevocable. We love to quote that verse. The gifts and call of God are irrevocable. God's call to the Jewish people is irrevocable. And yes, when it comes to the land, absolutely. But when it comes to the Torah, it's all the same way. So Jewish people, I'll let you wrestle with the Lord on this. Your ancestors were at Sinai. You said, we will do and we will hear. And if you're claiming that bloodline, you are guilty by implication, or uh, maybe not guilty, but you are there. Your ancestors made that, and you're declaring those are your ancestors. It's an ongoing covenant. Okay? Are we still good? We still love each other? Yeah. Is this helpful? Amen. Thank you, Father. It's his word, not mine, so take it up with him. We all get to be part of it. If you're engrafted in the Jewish people, you can certainly join the call and the mission to be a light to the nations. But you're coming alongside, and it's, uh, you're, you're getting it as you go. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing because you get to, not got to. You get that? We do need to obey what Yeshua taught us, absolutely. And there are principles in Scripture that we need to obey, without a doubt. And Paul's going to hit on those, so let's keep going. Paul takes care of this himself. Okay, so keeping reading along, he says, uh, For through the Ruach, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything, but only trust and faithfulness expressing itself through love. So some people have read this and say, well, there's no longer circumcision or uncircumcision. It doesn't matter. What are you talking about, Rabbi Jewish, non-Jewish? All that stuff's done away. We're all a new creation in Messiah Yeshua. All that stuff's passed. What are you talking about? Well, circumcision certainly still goes on. It's still part of the covenant. But it doesn't have relevance in uh, bringing salvation. Okay? What has relevance in bringing salvation is trusting faithfulness, expressing itself through love. So as far as you're standing before God, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or non-Jewish. You stand before him on the merit of Messiah Yeshua. Amen? You can't, you can't claim and say, my 20% DNA, I'm good, I'm in, or I have Abraham as my father, so I'm in. It doesn't work that way. Circumcision doesn't count. Uncircumcision doesn't count. What counts is trusting faith. If I was to summarize Paul on that, I would say Paul teaches being Jewish or not being Jewish doesn't make someone righteous. Faith expressed through love makes one righteous. Messiah Yeshua makes us righteous, but that faith, if we have true faith, is going to be expressed through love. Jacob, the brother of Yeshua, or James, taught us that faith without works is dead. True faith will have works. That's how faith works. True faith has fruit. Genesis 15, 6 says that we are, uh, we're told that Abraham believed Adonai, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That was way back in Genesis. It was salvation by faith. He believed God. That's Bethuhnah. Bethuhon. Emunah. Faith. Bittachon, trust, he believed the Lord, and Adonai counted it to him as righteousness. So it's been faith-based uh, righteousness all the way from the beginning, and it's uh, not contingent upon a person's uh, bloodline, but on their response to the revelation. Amen? Amen? 
So let's see, did I cut something out there? I read five through six. I'll read seven through the end here of 12, so you have it. I'm not going to comment on it because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, he's talking to non-Jews. He says to them, you were running a great race. Who blocked you from the truth? This detour doesn't come from the one who calls you. A little chametz works its way through the whole batch of dough. So this bad teaching worked its way in. He says, what's happened to you? Who, who, you're running. You're doing great. You're in Messiah Yeshua. Now who's blocked your way? You, you've gotten in some bad teaching here that's working its way all the way through the dough, the congregation. I'm confident in the Lord that you will uh, not think otherwise, but the one who is confusing you will pay the penalty, whoever he is. So someone came down, started teaching him bad teaching that you need to be Jewish to be saved, need to be circumcised or convert. Uh, but that's not the case. He says that's a false uh, teaching, and I, he's really against whoever that was that taught that. He says, as for me, brothers and sisters, if I still proclaim circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Pause just a minute there. It appears that Paul at one time taught you need to become Jewish in order to be saved, because he says if I'm still teaching circumcision, whenever you read circumcision, read it as uh, conversion. If I'm still preaching circumcision, becoming Jewish, why am I being persecuted? Remember, that was the whole issue of Paul going up to the temple there and uh, that he was uh, teaching uh, that you don't have to keep the Torah. <clears throat> he says, if I'm still teaching that you need to become Jewish to be saved, why am I be being persecuted? In this case, the stumbling block of the cross has been eliminated. I only wish that those who agitate you would go ahead and castrate themselves. And I won't be teaching on that. Now let's move on to verse uh, 13. Brothers and sisters, you who are called to freedom, only don't let your freedom uh, become an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole Torah can be summed up in the single saying, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not destroying one another. And continuing on... <clears throat> But I say, walk by the Ruach, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Ruach, but the Ruach sets its desires against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another, so that you cannot do what you want to do. But if you're led by the Ruach, you're not under the law. So what's he saying here? Hey, you're called to freedom. It's for freedom that he set us free. He set you free from sin, but don't let your, it's by grace that you're saved through faith, but don't let your grace and being saved by faith become an opportunity for the flesh. That's where I have an issue with the grace preachers. It's still a preaching of righteousness. There's still an expectation. It's not a license to sin. It's a license to obey. Amen. And through love, serve one another. For the whole Torah can be summed up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not destroying one another. I've met some Torah-keeping folks that were some of the most difficult people in the world to live with. Man, talk about divide and devour. They got the revelation of Shabbat. These were non-Jews, not Jewish people, non-Jews who got a revelation of the Torah. And man, they went around devouring everybody. The Catholics are wrong. The Baptists are wrong. The Presbyterians are wrong. Everyone, man, they're devouring and biting. It was ugly. Who wants to sign up for that? Every week, how wrong everybody else is and how right they are. Devouring each other. Yeshua says, uh, what the, how do you sum up the, the Torah? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor on your, as yourself. On these two hang all the law and prophets. Go and do likewise. Sometimes we need a new lesson on how to love one another. Which should be, should, Messiah loved us, we're supposed to love other people. You know, they're pulling his beard out, and he says, eh, you know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They're spitting in his face. Eh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Wow. That's a pretty radical love. I don't think I'm there yet. Maybe a little bit closer this year than last year. Love your neighbors, your staff. People that want to be Torah observant, I say, let's start with that. Let's start with love. Start with loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Wow. And generally, the rabbis translate strength as money. So are you tithing? You want to keep Shabbat, but you're not tithing? You missed the first commandment. You're not loving God with all your money because you don't trust him with your money. Oh, it got so quiet. <laughs> Rabbi, did you have to mention the tithe? 
Well, that was the first commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Strength. You trade your strength what you do for money. So you give your money instead of your strength. It's a good parallel. And then we'll talk about keeping Shabbat. Why am I raging on this? Because I know a, a leader, I know of a leader in, in the Hebrew roots movement who uh, was teaching, you need to be keeping Sabbath, Sabbath. God didn't change his day. It's not Sunday, it's Sabbath. And you need to keep Passover. You need to keep Shavuot. You need to keep Sukkot. And you need to go camping out in the woods because that's what we do at Sukkot. And teaching all this stuff. But then he gets up one week and says, you know, the Lord spoke to me that I'm supposed to Divorce this lady and be married to this lady. Friends, that wasn't the Lord. And all the while he was having an affair with this other lady. So you got Shabbat, right? But you're committing adultery. Let's start with the adultery thing and Shabbat can come later. There's weightier matters of the law, weightier matters of the Torah. Do you know there was a, oh, should I tell these stories? I hate to tell these stories. But there was a Hebrew roots gathering up in Dallas Years ago, you wouldn't know the people, although you might know some of the people. You might actually know some of the people. It was probably 15, 20 years ago. A big Hebrew roots gathering at a campground for Sukkot. They had such bad fist fights. Fist fights. They couldn't get along that they had to split up the camp. Friends, I think they missed the point. That's what I'm talking about here. Love your neighbor. They couldn't even get along. They're fist fighting. That's what Paul's saying. Guys, you missed the boat. So you keep Shabbat and you don't eat pork. Wow. Good for you. But you're devouring your neighbor. You missed the first commandment. And the second's like unto it. Love your neighbor. Do you see how it can be a subtle thing? I know there was a, you probably know. I just said, Lord, forgive me if I'm telling too many stories about this, but it needs to be exposed. There's a ministry on the internet that had a big following, and the guy ends up going to prison. But he's teaching everyone to keep the Shabbat and keep the Sukkot and keep the feast. Friends, I love the Shabbat. I love the feast. But you've got to do righteous things. Let's work on the weightier matters of the law. All right, I'll leave it alone. But you see where Paul's going. He's frustrated with these guys. Guys, you've missed it. Who's got you off track? Stick with Yeshua. He doesn't cancel the Torah. Following Yeshua will look a lot like Torah observance, but he's the, fir he is the focus, not the Torah observant thing. Do you see where he's going with this? Yeah. So I would say if Paul teaches that Gentiles need to focus on following the Ruach rather than focusing on the Torah, because the Ruach gives power over the flesh. Friends, the Torah in itself doesn't have the power to do that. It doesn't have the power. The Ruach is what gives us the power. So I'm not unapologetic about being a Ruach-centered congregation. It's the new covenant. It's the promise. If you're not comfortable with that, you're not comfortable with the new covenant. It's a matter of where our focus is. Keeping, keeping the first things first. Whoop. Well, I just turned the screen off. There we go. Wrong button. All right. So moving right along. Uh, let's see, did I skip a part? Nope. So, verse 19. So now he's going to talk about the deeds of flesh. And he spells them all out. This is what really should have been on that penny they gave me all those years ago. Hand me this. Now the deeds of the flesh are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, witchcraft. Hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, just as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that's a pretty good little list. And he says, and things like that. So he could go on and on in his list. But he's pointing out, guys, Shabbat's great, but you're in sexual immorality. Remember Corinthians? The guy's off with his, what was his, his father's wife? I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. And that was charismatics. Those were people that had the gifts of the Spirit. Impurity, indecency. I could go through and spell these things out, but impurity, I mean, indecency, 
saying vulgar stuff. Idolatry, anything you're putting before God is idolatry. Witchcraft. What it said rebellion is, is the sin of witchcraft. You want to know if you're in rebellion? How do you respond when somebody corrects you? A leader. You can, you can see rebellion rise up. Oof. Hostility, strife. <coughs> Jealousy, rage. Selfish ambition, dissension, factions, things that divide us and split us, envy. They shouldn't be up on the bema. I should be up on the bema. They shouldn't be the leader. I should be the leader. Crowsing. Wow. That would be a whole sermon. We could, send, we could do a whole series just on that list. Yes. Not in this group. That's not us. Jealousy. How come they get to be the leader, not me? Strife. No, I'm not going to cooperate with that. Dissension, division, fraction. Wow. That's kind of a dirty dozen list right there. Won't inherit the kingdom. Wow. So these will keep you out. Shabbat won't keep you out. These will keep you out. Wow. No fruit there. Yikes. That should be on that penny. Impurity, indecency. Sorry, friends, looking at porn is indecency. It's impurity. Sex outside of marriage, impure and indecent. Married or single. but the fruit of the Spirit. So these should be a pretty big warning sign. These will keep you out, out of the kingdom. Not eating pork won't keep you out. These will keep you out. But the fruit of the Ruach, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there's no Torah, no law. Now, those who belong to Messiah have crucified the flesh with his passions and his desires. If we live by the Ruach, let us also walk by the Ruach. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So he's contrasting the fruits of the flesh versus the fruits of the Ruach. Love, joy, peace. Some have said that really it's a, it's a, uh, the whole list is a commentary on love. If you have love, you'll have joy. If you have love, you'll have peace. If you have love, you'll have patience. Through the Ruach. So if the Ruach is operating in your life, this stuff should be coming forth. Now, fruit doesn't just grow overnight. I get that. If you're new to the faith, maybe you don't have all these yet. But if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, we should see these fruits operating in your life. If not, we've got to go back and say, Ruach Elohim, help. I lit the Shabbat candles. I came to Hebrew class. I did everything right. But he says, uh, where's your love? Where's your joy? Where's your uh, faithfulness? Where's your gentleness? Where's self-control? Self-control. Gentleness. Those things, there's no law against those things. Because you're, you're run by the rock. We don't need a Torah to keep us in line because we've got the rock keeping us in line. So if you live by the rock, let us walk by the rock. There's a halakha of the rock. So my last point, I would say, Paul teaches that Jews and non-Jews or Jews and Gentiles need to walk according to the halakha of the Ruach. Whoopsie. Wrong PowerPoint, that one. Jews and non-Jews need to walk according to the halakha, the Torah of the Ruach, in order to crucify our flesh. It comes down to the works of the flesh. And the only power we have over the flesh is the Ruach. We need the Ruach operating our life. I'm sure that out of that will certainly come Torah observance, but it's the byproduct, not the prime product. Do you see the difference of the focus? You can keep Shabbat. You can wear seat seats and a tallit and a kippah and look so righteous and holy and be full of iniquity. You can keep Sukkot to the letter of the law all seven days and even the eighth day and camp out in your little tent and think you're doing so righteous but be so angry at 
the person across the campground at you that you've completely nullified your whole observance because you got strife. Do you see what Paul's saying? Guys, who's bewitched you? You've missed the mark. You think you're connecting to the Jewish stuff will get you where you need to go. It won't get you there. The only thing that will get you there is the Ruach. Now, the churches are historically... Most branches of Christianity have taught a replacement theology that God's finished with the Torah. The Torah is not. The Torah hasn't changed. The Torah is the same yesterday. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word doesn't change. What changes is the administration of the Torah. Adonai writing on his heart, on our hearts through the ruach. And Paul's saying, guys, keep your focus where it needs to be. Keep it on the ruach. Have the ruach operating your life. And all these things will be added to you. But don't miss the main point. The main point is walking according to the rook and not according to the flesh. We all need to crucify the flesh. And it will look like Torah observance, without a doubt. But the Torah observance won't get us there. The ruach will get us there. That's Paul's message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.